Just give me a second for the bar to finish loading. All right, looks good to everybody. Everybody can see this. Yep. All right, I'm gonna start the webinar in three, two, one. Ok. Muito boa noite, todo mundo. É, boa tarde também, bo até bom dia. É, meu nome é Christopher Dunn, sou o diretor executivo da, da BRASA, Brazilian Studies Association, que é, como vocês sa devem saber, é um, uma associação bilingüe. Então, então é, é, a, a, a nossa sessão hoje também vai ser bilingüe. É, just a few words of welcome. Um, as you know, Braza is an interdisciplinary association dedicated to the promotion of Brazilian studies, particularly in the United States, where it has been based for the last 30 years. Um, you should all know that Braza does not have a permanent home, um, but rather seeks institutional hosts for periods of five years. And in 2020, uh, Braza came to Tulane University. After five years of extraordinary growth and vitality at Brown University with James Green as the executive director. A preeminent historian of modern Brazil, James has been a leading force within Braza since its earliest days. He served from president as, as president from 2002 to 2004 and executive director from uh, 2015 to 2020. And he was also at the forefront of what we might think of as an activist turn in Braza's mission, getting more involved with uh, advocacy uh, around issues of democracy and equality in Brazil. So we're grateful to him. And I want to just say that right uh, at the front uh, in, in the beginning. The global 19 pandemic erupted soon before, just before Braza 15, which was uh, slated to be uh, held at the University of Texas in Austin, and as you all know, sadly, we uh, it had to be canceled. Um, and I know that the team at the University of, of, of Texas worked so hard to get that together, and I'm hoping that one day, Braza can come back to UT Austin. And we also have to remember, I think as many of us all know, that the pandemic has taken the lives of over 650,000 in Brazil, nearly a million lives in the United States, and six million worldwide. As you all know, we had originally planned to hold a hybrid event hosted by Georgetown University with both in-person and virtual participation. But during the height of the Omicron surge uh, back in January, we made the difficult decision to move the event entirely online. And I would like to express my deep thanks to Brian McCann and his team at Georgetown University for making this transition to the virtual format. At Tulane, where Braza is now located, uh, the Secretariat is located for uh, until 2025, I'd like to thank the School of Liberal Arts under the inspired direction of Brian Edwards, a truly extraordinary dean who as a scholar of the Middle East and North Africa is deeply committed to global education. I'd also like to thank Tom Rees, the director of the Stone Center for Latin American Studies, one of the largest interdisciplinary centers devoted to Latin America in the US. Over the years, Tulane has attracted wonderful faculty and graduate students uh, who focus on Brazil. Now I'd like to pass the baton, the virtual baton as it were, uh, over to my colleague, Brian McCann, professor of history and past president of Braza between 2016 and 2018. 
Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, thanks to all the members of the executive committee here, and thanks so much to everybody joining us in the audience. We wish very much that we were able to welcome you to campus, but I'm very happy that we're able to put this together virtually, and we could not have done that without the support of Chris Sealing, who is with us tonight and is facilitating, and Chris Davis, from University Information Services, who also did a lot of the back end work here. And we have another nine facilitators organizing each of the rooms throughout the day. Rebecca Stowe is one of them, and she's with us here tonight, too. So thanks so much to that Georgetown team that has really made this possible, and to Chris Dunn and everyone at Tulane. Uh, I'm so grateful and so impressed that together we've been able to do this and my partner has been very small but grateful to everybody else for really making this happen and all four panels that I went to today were great so despite the challenges uh, we're able to come together and have this really stimulating academic discussion at a pivotal time for Brazil and for the world so thanks so much to everyone for that and it's an extraordinary pleasure to welcome Gladys Mitchell Worthauer so thank you so much. Over to you, Gladys. Thank you. So first of all, thank you um, for all the leadership of, of Braza. Boa noite a uh, todos e todas. It is so wonderful to virtually attend the 2022 Braza conference with you all. I actually felt a little underdressed after I saw my colleagues, but the advantage of a virtual conference is that I was able to run to my room change, put on a necklace. <laughs> so this has been wonderful. Um, so I am the past 2018-2020 Braza president. It has truly been a joy to serve this organization. My first Braza conference was nearly 16 years ago. Um, and it was where I met a number of scholars who became friends. Although we are in a virtual format, I hope that you all will have the opportunity to connect with other scholars, share ideas, and learn at this conference. I also hope that as scholars, we all remain committed to Brazilian academic freedom and democracy. Thank you, and I hope that everyone enjoys this conference. And now I am going to hand it over to my brilliant colleague, Marcelo Cachão. Thank you, Gladys. Uh, good afternoon for all. As you know, I'm a Brazilian, and I will uh, address my, my words in the Camões uh, language. Uh, muito obrigado a, a todos. Meu mandato ora no dia de hoje termina. Eu tivemos, né, meu mandato começaria uh, aqui em Austin, há dois anos atrás, e, obviamente, uh, Digamos que o mandato começa de uma forma bastante frustrante, porque fomos obrigados a, é, suspeitar, a cancelar uma conferência que vínhamos organizando, não apenas a minha, Sônia Roncador e outros colegas, há mais ou menos três anos. Então, portanto, foi muito frustrante, mas, por outro lado, durante os últimos dois anos, aprendi muito com os meus colegas, foi um orgulho, creio, se meus registros não estão errados, Eu fui o primeiro é, brasileiro a ser presidente da, da Brasa, o primeiro afro-brasileiro a ser presidente da Brasa, essa curiosa condição de ser um brasileiro brasileirista, e só encontrei amigos e amigas aqui dentro. Encontrei pessoas que de um raro talento, de uma rara sensibilidade, e que permitiram que a missão institucional da Brasa pudesse seguir em frente. A primeira missão institucional da Brasa, que é de garantir, de promover a cooperação acadêmica, o intercâmbio científico com a, os nossos pares que estão trabalhando no Brasil. Essa é a nossa primeira missão e cumprimos com vivo, vivo talento. E também é, comentar a nossa dificuldade, pelo momento que vivemos politicamente, é, não apenas uma pandemia, mas também todas as tentações autoritárias que cercam a sociedade brasileira, e que cercam a sociedade de todo mundo. Né? Estávamos há dois anos atrás com uma pandemia, hoje estamos aqui cheirando já o cheirinho de enxofre, 
de guerras, não apenas uma, várias pelo planeta, o homo sapiens parece que não aprende muito com a sua própria experiência. Então, é, foi um período difícil, né? apesar de ter sido um período de muito aprendizado, foi um período difícil e que é, cumprimos com a nossa é, devida é, é, dignidade, cumprimos com o nosso devido denudo. É, gostaria de agradecer o, o, o Brian McKay, não apenas por organizar uma conferência em um ambiente tão difícil, mas foi o Brian que me fez o convite uma, numa simpática tarde aqui em Austin para que eu me somasse ao comitê executivo e pensasse a sério em me candidatar à vice-presidência, à presidência da Brasa. Então, primeiramente, é o James Green, que vai ser um nome eterno para todos nós aqui que estamos é, reunidos. Agradecer ao Ramon Stern, que teve um papel fundamental também há algum tempo atrás na organização da Brasa, a Cláudia de Brito, que hoje também é, nos ajuda de uma forma fundamental. Ao Cris, querido amigo, que tive a honra de estar colaborando nessa, nessa missão. É Gladys, impossível, é difícil encontrar palavras para agradecê-la, para reconhecê-la, o brilhantismo e a elegância e o, e, o, e o carinho todos, que eu acho que não apenas eu, Marcelo, mas que toda a instituição sente pela nossa antiga presidente. E é, é dar minhas boas-vindas para a Erika Larkins, seja bem-vinda, a família Brasa, a família é, executiva, comitê da Brasa, te recebe de tapete vermelho estendido na porta, de braços abertos, e principalmente ao meu querido colega, nosso brilhante é, é, Sidney Chalou, que também é difícil encontrar adjetivos para qualificá-lo, um historiador que marcou é, é, tempo na, na na historiografia brasileira, com livros que são, acho que, de leitura obrigatória, eu, pelo menos, tenho aqui na minha, na minha estante seus livros e li com muito, com muito carinho, com muita atenção, principalmente o trabalho lá de Butiquim, Visão de Liberdade, nossa, que livros bonitos, sim. E seja bem-vindo, sim, para a presidência. Eu aqui encerro o meu trabalho, continuo na, como, como um dos officers, né, no meu período de dois anos, mas aqui encerro o meu trabalho como presidente da Brasa, esperando ter é, cumprido com a devida lealdade, com, a devida, com o devido engajamento, essa missão que me foi confiada. Acima de tudo, eu só gostaria de agradecer também, mais do que todos, aos associados da Brasília Estudos Association, que um dia tiveram que votar no meu nome, confiaram no meu trabalho, confiaram no meu nome para é, seguir à frente dessa instituição, e eu espero ter retribuído com a, da melhor maneira possível, estaremos juntos, o meu trabalho termina por aqui, como presidente da instituição, e dou realmente é, meu caloroso, minha, minhas calorosas boas-vindas ao nosso futuro presidente, que eu sei que trará com a sua qualidade acadêmica e pessoal as melhores contribuições para o futuro é, da nossa instituição. Então, só para concluir aqui, tem aquela poesia do, é, muita gente nesse período tão difícil para a nossa instituição, muitos poderiam pensar, ah, a Brasa vai ficar mais fraca depois de não ter conseguido é, organizar seu congresso em, em Austin. Não, pelo contrário, ela ficou mais forte, nós ficamos mais unidos. Então, me lembra aqui daquela musiquinha que Caetano canta, a renego de quem diz que o nosso amor se acabou, ele agora está mais firme do que quando começou. É assim que eu me sinto nesse momento e com essas palavras doces do nosso diretíssimo Caetano, que eu me despeço de todos vocês. Muito obrigado, do coração, por todo o apoio, por toda a parceria, por todo o companheirismo. Posso é, eu agora já? Ah, sim, é, eu gostaria de, de, de apresentar é, é, é o, o Sidney Chaloub, o Marcelo já fez um, uma, uma grande homenagem, é, mas eu passo a palavra para para Sidney. E, Sidney, eu queria é, só avisar que eu vou, durante sua fala, rapidamente eu vou mostrar um slide, para que, que vai ser uma pequena interrupção. Inter, vou interromper só um pouquinho. So, thank you all for being here. Welcome. Bem-vindos, bem-vindas, bem-vindes. Eu pensei em fazer um longo discurso inaugural como presidente da Brasa. Mas aí eu lembrei de uma crônica do Machado de Assis, na série Bons Dias, publicada em 16 de setembro de 1888. O narrador comentava uma longuíssima peça de teatro a qual havia assistido. E acabou chegando 
ou lembrando de uma invenção recente, o fonógrafo, que foi o primeiro aparelho capaz de gravar vozes para a posterior reprodução. Então, esse narrador comenta, aspas, reparando bem, está aqui o remédio a um dos males que afligem o regime parlamentar, o abuso da palavra. Não é fácil, mas é possível. Basta fazer uma escolha de oradores, um grupo para cada assunto, por ordem. Os restantes confiariam ao fonógrafo os discursos que a geração futura escutaria. No ano de 1913, veja que estamos em 1988, por exemplo, abriam-se os fonógrafos, segundo as formalidades necessárias, e os nossos filhos ouviriam a própria voz de algum orador atual discutir o orçamento da Receita Geral do Império. Fecha aspas. É isso. Isso tudo para dizer que o assunto palpitante do meu discurso é o orçamento da Brasa. Mentira. Eu começo com o Machado de Assis é, com algo do que temos de melhor para expressar a minha honra e alegria em aceitar o desafio de presidir a Brazilian Studies Association. Por isso, em vez de discurso, lhes ofereço apenas duas saudações. Em primeiro lugar, aos colegas das universidades públicas brasileiras, tantas e tantos entre nós, que têm enfrentado com determinação esses últimos anos de tragédia política no país. O modelo brasileiro de universidades públicas de ensino e pesquisa, financiadas quase inteiramente pelos contribuintes, com garantias constitucionais de autonomia didática e de pesquisa, é um patrimônio do país e da humanidade. Tenho certeza de que elas, em breve, voltarão a se expandir tornando-se ainda mais públicas, mais acessíveis. Não custa lembrar que as primeiras categorias que saíram às ruas contra o atual governo brasileiro, no primeiro semestre de 2019, foram os professores e professoras, estudantes, funcionários e funcionárias das universidades e escolas de todo o país. Saíram às ruas em defesa da liberdade acadêmica, esse conceito hoje em dia quase subversivo. Não apenas a liberdade de expressão, esse direito que as pessoas devem ter de dizer o que pensam em redes sociais e outros veículos, mas a liberdade acadêmica, o direito de produzir conhecimento independente, comprometido com os discursos de demonstração e prova pertinentes a cada disciplina, oferecidos de boa fé e comprometidos com a verdade, por mais que a saibamos, a verdade, condicionada por nossas perspectivas e escolhas, conscientes ou não, subjetividades, etc. Produzir conhecimento nas humanidades, em ciências sociais, em história, virou ato de resistência política da mais alta importância. E a Brasa deve estar comprometida com o conhecimento como valor, produzido com rigor e em diálogo constante com as demandas da sociedade por justiça social. Em segundo lugar, ofereço minhas saudações aos colegas a Brasa, ao presidente que se despede, Marcelo Paixão, mas que continua conosco como ex-presidente por mais dois anos. Uma saudação especial para Gladys Metchal Altar, agora ex-vice-presidenta, ex-presidenta, e ex-participante do Comitê Executivo na condição de ex-presidenta. Na Brasa e a Lures, Gladys tem sido uma é, lutadora incansável, totalmente solidária com o Brasil nesse momento difícil. Uma saudação muito especial aos colegas da University of Texas, Austin, que tiveram o congresso que haviam organizado com tanta dedicação e carinho, cancelado em cima da hora, devido ao início da pandemia em março de 2020. Obrigado a Brian, McKenna e a equipe de Georgetown, que se adaptou rapidamente às circunstâncias e nos oferece condições plenas para realizar este congresso por via remota. 
Last but not least, obrigadíssimo a Christopher Dunn, nosso diretor executivo e sua equipe em Tulane, por todo o trabalho que realizou ao lado de colegas do comitê executivo para tornar possível o presente congresso. Agora vou embora antes que alguém me mostre um fonógrafo. E vamos à luta em defesa da democracia nas eleições deste ano, tanto no Brasil quanto nos Estados Unidos. Desejo um bom congresso a todos. The host of Brasa 2024 will be San Diego State University. So I call Erica Larkins, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Banner Stiefel Center for Brazilian Studies at San Diego State University. And she has been elected, has just been elected, Brasa's Vice President, which means that she will also be our president beginning in 2024. Erica, this screen is yours. Thank you so much. Um, first, I, I just want to say um, on behalf of everyone at the Britt Boehner Stiefel Center for Brazilian Studies that worked to put together a proposal for hosting the conference. We're just so excited and grateful um, in the confidence of the executive committee for choosing us as host. Um, the conference is a ways off, April 2024. We're really confident that we can be in person and we're just so looking forward to, to having all of you here um, and really reconnecting. I know the, the virtual conferences are incredible in their own way. Um, and this is no doubt going to be a really memorable one, um, but we're also really looking forward to being together in person and hugging our colleagues, <laughs> um, you know, again. And so we're, we're just so pleased that we can have you all here. And um, April in San Diego is lovely. So uh, we're going to get planning a very memorable event. Um, in terms of uh, moving from that to the, to, um, My role as incoming vice president. Again, I just want to say that I'm really looking forward to this opportunity. Um, you know, it's an amazing opportunity to be able to be in a leadership role in this organization, especially I think at this very interesting and critical time. And I feel really lucky to have some time to learn from Sydney as president, um, because I'm quite sure that his his time is going to be. Um, really impactful for the organization. And of course, none of this would be possible without the really strong foundation that has been laid by past presidents, um, Marcelo Gladys and, and many, many others who I know are here and participating. So thank you, obrigada um, to everyone. And I'm really looking forward to doing this work with you. I also have the great pleasure to um, begin our awards presentation. I served as the chair of our Roberto Heis um, Book Prize this year, together with colleagues Leila Lenin and Ed Tellis, who was not able to be here with us. Um, we were, I mean, we've got to read an incredible array of books. Um, you know, every book that arrived on our desk was like a gift. <laughs> and so we had a really, um, a really productive and interesting um, time as a committee. And it was just, I, I really appreciated so much the chance to, to, to really see Braza for how it's, it's incredible interdisciplinary breadth. Um, we read books from lots and lots of different disciplines and we are going to award books from lots and lots of different disciplines. So I'd like to invite Leila now to begin the awards presentation. I think um, she's going to go first with our first one. Thank you, Erica, and I reiterate my thanks to everyone here, and I'm looking forward to coming to San Diego in April. <laughs> um, and so the first book award, we're pleased to award the Roberto Reyes Prize for a first book to Victoria Saramago for a Fictional Environments, Mimesis, Deforestation and Development in Latin America. Fictional Environments skillfully underscores literature's grounding and value for society via meticulous and insightful examination of how fictional works intervene in Latin American environments via imaginative practices and knowledge creation. Using a complex theoretical scaffolding, fictional environments brilliantly shows the importance of literature in generation, generating conversations about threats to various environments in Brazil and more broadly, the Americas, and how literary texts can inspire conservation efforts. 
Fictional Environments is one of those exceptional texts that change the way one thinks about literature, the interface between the literary work and society, and the role that literary scholarship can play in thinking about and interacting with the world around us. Fictional Environments will undoubtedly become a must-read reference for scholars dealing with Latin American environmental humanities and those studying Latin American literature more generally. Congratulations, Victoria. There we go. It wouldn't be a, a, a meeting online if I didn't forget to unmute one time. <laughs> um, we are pleased to award the Roberto Hayes Prize for a first book to Case Watkins for Palm Oil Diaspora, Afro-Brazilian Landscapes and Economies on Bahia's Dende Coast. Palm Oil Diaspora is a relevant, analytically rigorous, and grounded in real people's experiences, representing the best of interdisciplinarity and Brazilian studies. Watkins uses a methodologically innovative combination of archival records, geospatial mapping, and ethnography to masterfully narrate the entanglements of geography, history, and social environments among Afro-Brazilians. His superb history and ethnography of this potent icon of the Afro-Brazilian diaspora is a perceptive analysis of the complexities underlying the relationship between Black communities, environments, and power. In particular, palm oil diaspora is an indispensable history for anyone interested in the movement of plants, peoples, and African knowledge systems in the Americas. So congratulations to Case. We are pleased to award the Roberto Reyes Book Prize to Rafael Cardoso for his book, Modernity in Black and White, Art, Image, Race, and Identity in Brazil, 1890 to 1945. In this groundbreaking text, Cardoso provides an account of modern art and modern, modernism in Brazil. Departing from previous studies, mostly restricted to the elites, elite arenas of literature, fine arts, and architecture, this book situates cultural debates within the wider currents of Brazilian life. From the rise of the first favelas in the 1890s and 1900s to the creation of samba and modern carnival, over the 1910s and 1920s and tracking the expansion of mass media and graphic design into the 1930s and 1940s. Cardoso deftly foregrounds aspects of urban popular culture that have been systematically overlooked. Against this backdrop, Cardoso provides a compelling rereading of anthropophagia and other modernist currents, locating them within a broader field of cultural modernization. In sum, Combining extensive research with close readings of a range of visual cultural production, the volume brings to light a rich archive of art and images in a compellingly written text, accessible across disciplines. Parabéns to Dr. Cardoso for his excellent achievement. And finally, we are pleased to present the prize to Ben Cohen for his book, Moral Majorities Across the Americas, Brazil, the United States, and the Creation of the Religious Right. In this meticulously researched book, Cohen chronicles the advent of a hemispheric religious movement in both Brazil and the United States. These two countries, he astutely argues, played host to the principal activists and institutions who collaboratively fashioned the ascendant, ascendant religious conservatism of the late 20th century. In his text, he not only unearths fascinating historical connections between Brazilians and U.S. religious conservatives, but also proves just how essential Brazilian thinkers, activists, and institutions were to engendering right-wing political power in the Americas. More specifically, the book shows that both Protestant and Catholic religious warriors began to dialogue in the 1930s around a passionate aversion to mainstream ecumenicalism and modern, moderate political ideas. Brazilian intellectuals, politicians, religious leaders, and captains of industry worked with partners at home and in the United States to build the United Right. Together, they engaged in a series of reactionary theological discussions. Their transnational, transdenominational platform fostered a sense of common cause and allowed them to develop a series of strategies that pushed once marginal ideas to the center of public discourse. 
Moral majorities across the Americas significantly informs and transforms our understanding of Brazil's political history. Congratulations to Dr. Cohen for his outstanding book. And I would like to now invite colleagues, uh, Sonia Hungador and Carolina Elena Chimoteo de Oliveira um, to present more of our awards. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Biz and Tolman Prize Committee that I served as chair and counted on Sonia Roncador, Inaya Lopes dos Santos, and Andrew Janus, I announced the Tolman Award winners. Adriana Tolentino Souza, doutoranda em Educação na Universidade de São Paulo. O título do projeto, Eu Sou Tudo Que Eles Não Esperavam. Sua pesquisa reflete sobre as, a experiência de mulheres negras nas relações de trabalho e sua pesquisa um, que gozam de função de, de privilégio social, notariamente nos campos de direito, engenharia e da medicina. Parabéns, Adriana. Um, Giovanni Santos, PhD student in Latin American Studies at Tulane University. The project title, Bola 7 and the Legacy of Misinterpretation in Bossa Nova. A Story of Racism, Narrative Building, and the Cultural Cancellation. His research contributes to the narrative of Bossa Nova's history opposing to the culture of erasure, by recognizing its Black roots and Black artists, challenging the assumptions of the genre as colorblind and apolitical. Parabéns, Giovanni. Juliana Siqueira Franco, PhD student in philosophy in the Universidade Estadual de Campinas. The project title, Gida de Melo e Souza on Anita Malfatti. Challenges of a Woman Artist in the First Phase of Brazilian Modernism. Her research explores Gilda de Melli Souza aesthetic thought by studying an excerpt from her essay on visual arts of the first modernism of São Paulo, Vandargua e Nacionalismo na década de 1920. Parabéns, Juliana. João Batista Negror, uh, Gregor, PhD candidate in history at the University of Kansas. Project title, The Forgotten Voices of Democracy, Black Political Activism Under Brazil's Military Rule. His research focuses on demonstrating that the Brazilian Black movement should be recognized as one of the civil rights groups that call for the end of authoritarian regime in Brazil. Thank you for, um, for the applications, amazing projects, and congratulations to all the winners. Um, now, Sonia is going to announce the BIS winners. Okay. Uh, it, was a, it was a real pleasure to read uh, so many strong projects this year. Unfortunately, we had money only for three, and now I will uh, present briefly uh, the winners of the, the BIS uh, prize. Uh, the first one is Paula Costa Nunes de Carvalho, a PhD student in sociology at USP, Universidade de São Paulo, and her project title is Geopolitics of Brazilian Music, Transits of Brazilian Artists in and Out of the Country in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, Carvalho's research proposes to map and unpack Brazilian musicians' personal, political, and material circumstances of immigration to the U.S., in the 60s and 70s. Parabéns, Paula. Uh, the second winner of the Bs is uh, Caio Afonso Leone, a PhD student in history at Universidade Federal Fluminense, UFI. Uh, the project title is Yes, We Have Letras, Práticas Editoriais para Seleção, Tradução e Publicação de Autores Brasileiros pela, pela editora Alfred Knopf. Uh, 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 1942, 1989. Uh, Leone's research uh, uh, proposes to dig into the records of translation and publication contracts between Alfred Knopf's uh, publishing uh, firm and a number of Brazilian writers such as Gilberto Freire and Jorge Amado. Uh, Alfred Knopf's uh, archive is held by the Harry Branson Center at UT Austin. Congratulations, Caio. Parabéns, Caio. And uh, the last third winner, uh, Alex uh, Landberg, 
a PhD uh, student in Latin American history at Northern Illinois University. His project is titled Moral Bonds, Modern Subjects, Peculio, Property Rights, and the Moral Economy of the Enslaved on the Eve of Abolition in Rio de Janeiro, 1850-1888. Uh, Lundberg's uh, study of the pre-abolition system of hiring out slavery demonstrates not only the material, but also the moral and affective impact of slaves earned peculiar on 19th century Black subjectivity and agency. So congratulations to all. These projects are amazing and we are mu very much looking forward to the result of this uh, research. And I'm now passing the word to our dear colleague uh, here, Isis Barra Costa, the chair of the Lifetime Contribution Award. Obrigada, Sonia. Thank you all for joining us here tonight at, in this virtual ceremony. Thank you colleagues at the Braza Executive Committee for all your hard work and support during this remarkably difficult pandemic years. And thank you, Ben Cohen and Rebecca Tensio for joining me in the committee in charge of selecting the ninth recipient of this award, which was first bestowed upon Thomas Skidmore in 2006. It is a great privilege to be here tonight presenting the 2022 Brazos Lifetime Contribution Award to Dr. Peggy Sharp, Emeritus Professor of Spanish and Portuguese at Florida State University. As a member of Braza since its beginnings, Professor Sharp has been part of a groundbreaking generation of women scholars who established the basis for intersectional scholarship on women's studies with a focus on Brazilian women writers. In 1996, she organized the conference Resistance and Identity at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. The project brought together writers and scholars such as Helena Parente Cunha, Lia Lufti, Marina Colassanti, and Nelly da Pinon, as well as Maria José Samerlet Barbosa, Susan Kinlan, Cristina Ferreira Pinto, and Naomi Roque Muniz. Peggy Sharp published the communications of the seminal encounter under the title Entre Resistir e Identificar-se, para uma teoria da prática da narrativa brasileira de autoria feminina. Like other femin literary feminist scholars of the 80s and 90s, Peggy Sharp was one of the pioneers in reclaiming overlooked and misinterpreted works of women writers who have been erased from history and canon. With Susan Kinlan, she co-authored Visões do Passado, Previsões do Futuro, Duas Modernistas Esquecidas. In this joint publication, Peggy and Susan retrieved from archives the writings of early Paulista feminists, Adalzira Bittencourt and Ercilia Nogueira Cobra. Peggy also republished avant-garde Brazilian women writers such as Nizia Floresta and Julia Lopes de Almeida, and translated feminists such as Rosisca Darcy de Oliveira. Dr. Peggy Sharp served as president of Braza from 2008 to 2010. She participated in the early development and consolidation of Braza as well as other organizations such as APSA. She has overseen the creation of multiple programs and departments at University of Illinois, University of Mississippi, the United Arab Emirates University, 
and Florida State University and taught in Brazilian universities as Universidades Federais do Maranhão, Pernambuco, and Minas Gerais. Peggy has been a reference, a role model, and a mentor for a whole generation of Brazilianist literary feminist scholars. I share with you statements from some of her nominators. Regina Felix tells us, Professor Sharp is one of the most genuine colleagues in the field of Brazilian studies. She was my professor and doctorate advisor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. A wise and earnest educator, Professor Sharp was the mentor whose life and academic teachings were decisive in my and others' professional pursuits. Margot Milleret wrote, what I remember most about Peggy Sharp is her support for her graduate students and their development as scholars and as creative teachers. She was a role model for how to juggle all the demands of supervising and teaching while at the same time participating in family life. She was active in conferences on innovative teaching and contributed groundbreaking research in a field that was barely getting off the ground. And last but not least, Emanuele Oliveira Monte. It is with great honor, she says, that I write to celebrate the work and legacy of Peggy Sharp. I first met Peggy at a Brazilian Studies Association conference when I was just a graduate student at UCLA, starting my academic career. She could have ignored me, this starting graduate student who had good but unpolished ideas on race and race relations in Brazil. Instead, she embraced me and valued my work, provided, providing invaluable guidance when very little guidance was available. Decades have passed now, and Peggy is still the model I seek to emulate. I could never reach her intellectual brilliance, but I only hope to be as generous, supportive, and open to a new generation of Luso-Brazilian female scholars as Peggy was to me. Thank you, Peggy, for all that you have done for the field and for all that you represent to women in academia. I ask all of you who are virtually here with us tonight to celebrate and congratulate Dr. Peggy Sharp recipient of the 2022 Brazos Lifetime Contribution Award. Muito obrigada, Peggy. Okay. Bem. Easy, I hardly know who you're speaking about. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> boa, boa tarde, boa noite, ou possivelmente até bom dia, depending on where you're located at this moment. It was a complete surprise, as well as an indescribable pleasure, to receive Professor Dunn's email last week with the news about the Lifetime Contribution Award. So first, I'd like to express my heartfelt appreciation to the colleagues who submitted the nomination and to the committee for its reflection and munificence. As I contemplated what to say this evening, I mulled over the why I became interested in Brazil so long ago and how that interest led me to an academic career that focused primarily on Brazilian studies. I think it all began with an exchange student from Fortaleza who lived with my family for a year when I was in high school, and this is in the dark ages. Most of you were not even born yet. My new Brazilian sister introduced me to the melodic sounds of the language and the rhythms of Brazilian music, in particular Bossa Nova, which was starting to gain popularity in musical circles in the US at the time. 
While I wasn't old enough to get into the bars in Greenwich Village where some of the Brazilian artists were performing, I did start collecting their albums at record stores in the city. I spent hours listening to the music. And since I was studying several romance languages at the time, it wasn't long before I could begin to understand some of the lyrics. Unfortunately, Portuguese wasn't offered at my undergraduate institution. So I took a quarter off during my second year of studies and traveled to Fortaleza, where I experienced my first Brazilian Christmas and Réveillon in late 1967 in Plena Ditadura. Carnaval several months later, bonfires on the beach in the evenings and serenatas outside my bedroom window in the middle of the night. I also spent a month in Rio with relatives of the Ciarense family. And during that time, we took a bus trip to Minas Gerais with a stop in Brasilia, where I saw part of the nation's new capital still under construction. Those first three and a half months in Brazil sealed the deal for me. I was infatuated with Brazil and its people. Several years later, I had the opportunity to spend an academic year in Recife on a Rotary Ambassadorial Scholarship. My time in Pernambuco allowed me to take classes at the university with several well-known scholars of Brazilian literature, meet and talk with the Archbishop Dom Elder Câmara in the Praça do Derme, meet Gilberto Freire, the artist Francisco Brenan, Ariano Suassuna, who was the rector of the Federal University at the time, and finally, Luis Gonzaga, who looked me up and down for a few seconds and proclaimed, O oh, galega bem nutrida. I enrolled in a research class taught by the esteemed anthropologist, David Maybury Lewis. And it was during that time that I met his teenage son, Bjorn, who became the second renowned anthropologist of the family and whose numerous contributions to Braza over the years are widely recognized. My project in that class was to travel to the Zona da Mata and the Alto Sertão de Pernambuco to interview a list of coronés políticos. My most treasured memory of that experience was the moment in which one of the coronés looked at me with disapproval over the nature of a question and responded indignantly with an unmistaken authoritative tone, desse a respeito, moça. As a Rotary scholar, I was expected to travel to clubs throughout the Northeast to talk about the burgeoning feminist movement in the US, which was the topic I'd proposed in my application. I'll never forget the seemingly interminable bus trips to places as far away as Piauí, nor the hospitality shown to me by the host families in each town. Given the makeup of the Rotary Clubs back in 1972, I was not surprisingly the only woman in the room during my talks. Fortunately, the debates were lively and even humorous at times, but the Rotarians set me straight on the subject of feminism taking off in Brazil. While women were esteemed, and even revered for their role in the family, highly respected for their contributions to education, the law and business, there was no ground for a social or ideological movement to promote women's status in Brazilian society. Years later, as I perused the reading list for my doctoral exams in Brazilian literature, I counted the number of women writers on the 17 page reading list. Cecilia Mireles, Raquel de Queiroz, Clarice Lispector, and Lígia Fagundes I recall asking one of my Portuguese professors why there were so many escritores and so few escritoras on the list. Now this is during binary times, so <laughs> this is in the 70s. And uh, I was duly informed that there were very few women writers of merit and most of their work had no impact in literary circles. My indignance over the professor's response led to the conviction that I would focus my research efforts on women writers. I knew they were out there and that they deserved to be read. And the rest is history. The past decades have been action-packed and adventurous, 
Filled with travel and professional challenges, I never envisioned when I started out on this path. The opportunities to collaborate with so many bright, creative, generous, and accomplished scholars, writers, and translators in the US and Brazil have taught me so much about the artistic process and its many guises. The graduate students I've been fortunate enough to work with are now teachers and scholars with outstanding careers at institutions in various countries. And I prize the friendships and intellectual discourse we've developed over the years. My undergrads have kept me current on social conventions among the young, and more recently, the art of body ornamentation. And I'm amazed at the, at the, um, at the many ways they've incorporated their interest in Brazil into their careers and personal lives. I've also relished taking students to study abroad in Brazil over the years, watching them attempt, attempt to dance the shashab at local forros, supervising their piranha fishing trips in Amazonian waters with local guides, glimpsing their excitement as they observed water go down the drain counterclockwise, or their curiosity as they observed sloths moving slowly along a branch on treks through the Selva Amazonica. In fin, witnessing them fall in love with the Brazilian language and people. All these experiences have filled my heart. I wouldn't have had it any other way. And I'm grateful for this moment of acknowledgement from my colleagues. At the end of the day, your recognition has made each and every struggle along the way worthwhile. Thank you for honoring me with this award. And since I'm speaking to you from Lisbon tonight, I'd like to raise a glass of fine Portuguese wine to a thought provoking and inspiring conference. Thank you. Quem me der é ter uma taça de vinho também para te acompanhar. <laughs> Parabéns, Peggy. Fico muito feliz. Muito obrigado. Thank you so much for your contributions. Um, and I, as I said to you privately, um, you know, we're also disappointed that we couldn't get together in Washington, D.C., but that we're committed to bringing you over to San Diego in 2024. And by that time, we'll have another, you know, recipient, but uh, we want to at least have the opportunity to honor you in person uh, at that event. Um, but thank you for, for joining us uh, virtually. Um, and that was a beautiful um, uh, acceptance speech, if you will. And it was, it really gave us a, a, a great sense of the, the field, the, the history of the field, in, particularly in literary studies and, um, and, and, and your role in, in really redefining and changing it. So thank you for, for everything. Um, all right, so moving on, I think we're doing great for time, but I want to, at this uh, time, uh, talk a little bit about um, the sort of administrative structure of Braza, um, which depends um, heavily on an executive committee um, with uh, members based in the US and Brazil. Um, but I should also note that um, scholars based elsewhere in the world are also eligible to stand for election in this committee. So if you're interested in getting more involved in Braza, as I hope you are, uh, please consider that. Um, we're always looking for people uh, who are engaged and, and interested in, in, um, in building the, the, the association. And as executive director, um, I can attest to the key role of EC members in providing advice, heading up committees, and helping to build the organization. Um, I mean, uh, and some of these committees, as pleasurable as they are, as Erica mentioned are very uh, time consuming as well, reading all of those books and, and then deciding which ones are the uh, merit, uh, the, the Roberto Reyes prize. Um, these, these are, uh, you know, these are tasks that take quite a bit of dedication. And I just wanna say, I'm so appreciative to those who, who, who took, you know, uh, on those roles uh, within, the, within the executive committee. Um, so what I'd like to do at this point, and this is, this is gonna also illustrate to you a little bit how the executive committee works. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again um, and show you here. Um, the Start with the 
the, the Braza uh, EC that served for four years and their terms are ending right now. And I just want to acknowledge those who have been so active um, in the last four years that and whose term is ending, but of course they're going to still, I hope, remain very active within the organization. Inés Dorado, Leila Lenin, and Marcia Lima. Uh, thank you very much. Muito obrigado. Uh, Tiana, uh, Pas uh, Pasha, Tiana Pachel, um, Patricia Pino, and Sonia Juncador. Uh, again, uh, thank you uh, for your uh, great contributions um, over the last um, uh, four years. Next, I'd like to uh, thank the group that was uh, came into the executive committee in 2020. My colleague at Tulane, Rebecca Atencio, Isis Barra Costa, who you've all already heard from, um, and who, as I said, did that wonderful work of, of chairing the, um, the, the Lifetime uh, Contribution Award. Thank you so much, Isis, and, and Benjamin Cowan. Uh, let, and uh, Reagan Gil Gillum and Erica Rob Larkins, who's on our executive committee and who's also been now, as you know, elected to vice uh, president, um, and uh, Inae Lopez dos Santos. So thank you all so much uh, for ser your service, and I'm very pleased that you'll be continuing on for the next uh, for the next two years. Um, and finally, um, let me see here. I got a. The new uh, members of the executive committee that I want to con congratulate for their being elected. Uh, we have Amy Chaskell of Columbia University, Ana Paulina Lee, also of Columbia, Ocasio Tovo from Florida International University, uh, Flavia Rios, Universidade Federal Fluminense, Aldair Rodriguez, Universidade Estadual de Campinas. Rebecca, uh, Rebecca Tarlau, I have a hard time switching between Portuguese and English pronunciation from Penn State and uh, Rubia Valenci from Baruch uh, College. And we're just delighted to uh, welcome these new members uh, to uh, the, the EC. The, their terms essentially start <laughs> right now um, as we start thinking about some of the objectives and goals for Braza uh, uh, for the next, uh, you know, for the future, and certainly for the next two years, as we plan our very exciting uh, Congress, uh, the 17th Congress in San Diego. And finally, I would be remiss without, um, and and Marcelo uh, delivered a beautiful homage to to Gladys, as did and several others. Uh, but I want to express my personal thanks, and really on behalf of all of the Brazilian Studies Association, to Gladys Mitchell Wator. Uh, Associate Professor and Department Chair of African and African Diaspora Studies at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. She's uh, now served as Vice President, President, and Past President of Braza for the last six years. Uh, this is something, an uh, administrative uh, structure that I think works very well in Braza. It really uh, helps with basically with continuity um, to have uh, someone serve first as VP and then sort of accede to the presidency and then stay on on the executive committee as past president, uh, which is always so helpful. Um, she has been an extraordinarily active and helpful on, at all, in all three roles. Um, I remember, for example, as VP, the, 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 she, she did so much, uh, as I recall, um, in the, the preparation for the uh, meeting in Rio de Janeiro, which was the last time we all met in person. Uh, and then as president, uh, she, she really brought in a lot of new people into the organization. And as past president, I can tell you um, these last two years have been challenging for all the reasons that we know. And she's been so helpful to all of us. And frequently I turn to her guidance and wisdom. At the same time, it's important to recognize as others have uh, during this uh, this uh, this session today, has remained extremely committed to social justice and equality in Brazil, combining her academic commitments and her support for democracy uh, in Brazil. So I just want to thank you, Gladys. There you are. <laughs> um, thank you so much for everything, and um, I just want to say. Um, 
you know, I, I, we, we really, even though you're rotating off the pre past presidency and you're very much involved in other academic organizations and your own research and teaching, I hope that you, uh, we can continue to count on you and we'll see you at Braza uh, 2024. So thank you again. Muito obrigado. And okay, one more share screen. I would like to also thank someone who's not here. I think she's gone home already, but Claudia Di Brito, for those of you who don't know her, we know her around here at Tulane very well. She's been the executive direct, uh, secretary of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese for uh, over 20 years. And now she's serving as the administrative uh, director. Um, and she's uh, absolutely wonderful. And I just wanted to, to thank Claudia for all of, uh, all of, um, of her assistance with, uh, with the Congress and Braza in general. Um, I feel like I've missed something and I gotta go back here. I did miss something. I just noticed this. Ah, I'm so sorry. I missed a whole slide um, of, of EC members, <laughs> and I really apologize. Fabio de Sai Silva, Vitoria Saramago, and Carolina Chimotu de Oliveira. And the reason it occurred to me was that I wanted to say something special about Carolina, who's a graduate student here uh, at Tulane University in Latin American Studies, and who's also been a wonderful help um, as the uh, editor of the Braza Digest. Uh, and she gets that out every week. So thank you so much. And my apologies to the three of you for uh, uh, for somehow missing that slide. Did I miss any other slides? Why don't we review them all to make sure. Um, and thank to, thanks to all of those on the EC um, and congratulations to the new members coming in. Uh, and uh, there's Claudia. So finally, I would like to, vou passar a palavra, Agora para Marcia Lima, que é professora do Departamento de Sociologia da Faculdade de Filosofia, Letras e Ciências Humanas da Universidade de São Paulo. E é, eu queria notar que Marcia tem sido é, também assim, uma, uma participa é, participante é, da, 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 do comitê executivo muito, muito engajada. E eu gostaria, pessoalmente, Marcia, e em nome da Brasa, agradecer a você por tudo que tem feito para a Brasa ao longo dos anos que você passou no, no Comitê Executivo. Obrigada, boa noite a todos, todas, todos. É um enorme prazer estar aqui com vocês. Eu queria agradecer muito vocês a oportunidade de, de participar desse comitê. Eu participei de três diferentes momentos, três bancas diferentes, processos seletivos de prêmios, é, organizar o, o, o encontro desse ano. É, então, assim, é um momento, é muito interessante também, né? É uma oportunidade né? de conhecer a produção sobre o Brasil é, para fora do Brasil também. Dentro e fora do Brasil, que a gente também acaba conhecendo muito da produção intelectual brasileira na própria Brasa, né? Nós que somos brasileiros, professores da universidade no Brasil, a gente também é, se depara com trabalhos muito interessantes, tanto dentro do Brasil como fora, e eu acho que isso é, 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 muito, é, é uma experiência muito rica, eu agradeço muito a confiança, é, foram, foram ótimos momentos, é, é, trabalhar com vocês é, foi muito bom. É, eu acho que tem uma coisa muito importante, o Sidney falou disso, é, mas eu quero rapidamente retomar né, a importância que a universidade teve nos últimos quatro anos, a Universidade Brasileira e sua resistência, mas a importância das associações científicas também. Eu acho que a Brasa teve um papel muito importante na resistência, que a gente ainda está... É, é, ainda estamos na luta, né? temos muito, é, é, muitas coisas ainda pela frente, mas eu acho que existir uma associação como a Brasa ajuda a gente a, a pensar o Brasil e a lutar pelo Brasil, considerando esse momento tão difícil que a gente está vivendo. Né? É, eu vou, como todo mundo, agradecer os heróicos organizadores desse evento virtual, isso é realmente, acho também, gente, quem está participando, é, paciência, né, porque a gente está todo mundo se adaptando a isso, já fizemos, todo mundo já fez, já participou de eventos, a gente sabe que é mais cansativo, que é mais complicado, mas eu acho que é super importante a gente estar tá aqui, 
é, e, e, e conseguir, né, que a gente tenha conseguido fazer esse evento, foi uma decisão muito difícil do comitê, é, mas eu acho que foi uma decisão acertada, considerando o quadro que a gente tem hoje, é, eu acho que isso é muito é, importante. Eu estou aqui também para lembrá-los e apresentar as plenárias que nós teremos, é, as plenárias da Brasa, é, que é esse momento onde a gente pode é, reunir todas as pessoas que estão participando, que não, não vão estar em grupos, né? E foi difícil para o comitê também decidir, né? É, o Brasil tem todas as questões nesse momento, que a gente teria que tomar uma decisão sobre as questões mais prementes para trazer para esse debate, né? Então, a, a, a diretoria e o comitê executivo, a gente optou por dois, dois grandes temas é, é, sobre o Brasil. É, o primeiro, né, a primeira plenária, que vai acontecer amanhã, sobre ações afirmativas e o acesso ao ensino superior no Brasil, um balanço das últimas décadas, das duas últimas décadas. É, o tema é, foi escolhido muito em virtude da, dos 10 anos da Lei 12.711, que é a lei que instituiu as cotas nas universidades brasileiras, e que revolucionou, podemos dizer, o perfil do discente das nossas, da universidade no Brasil. Esse é um tema muito importante da nossa agenda. É, a gente tem feito pesquisa sobre isso, mas é, é, também é um tema que a gente tem que não só pesquisar, mas também militar academicamente para que as coisas aconteçam no Brasil. E esse tema, é, a gente está também vivendo uma narrativa sobre a, os 10 anos da lei, no debate público, muito difícil, que é a ideia da, da, de que as cotas terminam, que elas estão, que têm que ser prorrogadas, né? ou seja, não existe na lei é, nenhuma, é, nada que indique o fim da lei, os 10 anos é para propor uma revisão da lei, que pode ou não ser feita, é, então acho que é importante a gente chamar atenção para essa questão é, e, e trazer também é, uma discussão, também estão tendo os painéis falando das ações afirmativas, é um tema muito estudado no Brasil e fora do Brasil, e eu acho que a, a gente vai ter uma boa conversa amanhã sobre é, esse painel, onde eu estarei presente com dois colegas, Luiz Augusto Campos, do, do IESP, o ERG, e o Adriano Senkevich, que é pesquisador do INEP, e que fez um excelente, um excelente trabalho sobre... Ele acabou de defender a tese com dados que, que ele é, teve acesso via INEP, que são muito importantes para a gente entender o que está acontecendo no Brasil hoje. Né? E a segunda plenária é de um tema muito esperado por todos nós, né? de muitas maneiras, há quatro anos a gente espera poder falar das eleições no Brasil, né? terminar essa, esse momento, esse pesadelo, mas ao mesmo tempo a gente sabe que não é fácil. Né? É, a, a discutir eleições e democracia é, é, neste contexto eu acho que a gente está diante de um ano eleitoral muito atípico no Brasil não apenas pelo fim de um ciclo né? esperamos um fim de um ciclo é, 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 de, um, de um governo de muitos retrocessos mas também de um governo que não valoriza a democracia né? um, um, um governo eleito que põe em xeque a própria demo, a democracia então, acho que é muito importante que a gente se dedique a pensar, né, como intelectuais, como acadêmicos, como pesquisadores voltados para entender o Brasil, o sentido da democracia e eleições no Brasil. E aí nós teremos é, o Sidney Chalub, né, organizando a sessão, e temos como convidados a Débora Diniz, a professora Débora Diniz, da Foz Feminista, o professor Fábio de Sai Silva, da Universidade de Oklahoma, e o professor José Murilo de Carvalho. O moderador será o Brian McKen. É, acho que a gente tem é, duas oportunidades, né? além das, dos painéis né, que já estão acontecendo, das atividades que estão acontecendo nos grupos, eu acho que esse é um momento muito importante para a gente discutir é, questões muito importantes da agenda do intelectual e da agenda política do Brasil, e é realmente um enorme desafio é, pensar essas duas agendas. Né? pensar a agenda da inclusão racial e a agenda da democracia e lembrando que democracia também é onde como diz como tem né a nossa não existe democracia se tem racismo né então acho que também a gente acaba juntando essas pautas é, é, sobre a inclusão racial e sobre a democracia também é uma eleição muito importante que vai ser a primeira eleição é, federal né onde o TSE 
mudou a lei em relação a, a, aos recursos para candidatos negros. Então, é, estamos vivendo realmente momentos no Brasil muito tensos, de muita transformação, e isso não poderia ficar fora da agenda da Brasa. É, acho que é isso. Muito obrigado, Márcia. É, e é, eu, eu tenho certeza que as plenárias, as sessões plenárias vão ser muito é, muito interessantes. É, e eu agradeço a você e a Sidney por, ter, por terem é, organizado é, estas é, sessões. É, e, mais uma vez, muito obrigado por su, su, sua é, é, participação na Brasa ao longo desses quatro anos e eu espero que continuem a ser um elo né, entre é, a intelectualidade brasileira e a nossa organia, or, e, a, a, e também os militantes e a nossa organização a Brasa é, e que espero é, revê-la em, em San Diego <risos> em Parei 20, lá. 24 é, eu acho que é só isso. Eu, gente, eu não sei se estou esquecendo alguma coisa. Se alguém quiser falar, é, temos ainda 15 minutos. Fizemos muito bem. <risos> Ninguém falou demais. Seguimos as ordens de Machado de Assis. É, Sini, se você quiser é, lembrar é, a sua sessão maravilhosa, que vai ser no sábado, não é? Sobre Machado. Não é isso? É. Então... É... Sim, mas acho que tá bom, Cris. A gente pode tomar um vinho mais cedo. É, vamos tomar um vinho com, com, com Peg. Peg, quem nos der está aí com você, tomando uma taça de vinho. É... Pois é, já é quase de madrugada aqui. Já é quase de madrugada. <risos> ok. Muito Preciso bem. fazer um, um, um congresso da Brasa aqui em Lisboa agora. Isso! É uma coisa. Olha. Se já tivemos Congresso da Brasa Nossa, em Londres... Por essa que não é uma ideia boa? brilhante. Essa é uma é, ideia brilhante. Eu também acho. Vem para cá. <risos> então, já temos assim, uma proposta. E pegue, <risos> você pode ser a organizadora, não é? Ah, não. Estou <risos> <Ai, eu. risos> brincando. Tô Mas é uma ótima ideia. Uma ótima ideia. <risos> Vamos pensar nisso. Mas é, agora é San Diego 2024. Não, é ainda estamos no espaço virtual sediado em Georgetown, por mais dois dias. Hoje foi ótimo. Eu também assisti vários painéis, assim, meio é, entrando e saindo, é, mas eu vi muita coisa interessante e eu tenho certeza que os próximos dois dias vão ser maravilhosos. É, muito obrigado é, e até amanhã. <risos>